Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of More to Explore, where we like to keep you updated with everything happening on the largest live nature network. Good morning to a couple of people already in chat. Hello to Jackie and Carrie. Thank you for joining us. And my name is Brian Bird, and I'll be your technical director today, pushing all the buttons behind the scenes. And to teach us about the wildlife we see today is our resident naturalist, Mike Fitz. Thanks for being here today, Mike. You're welcome. Thanks for having me uh, join you once again. And for those of you who are new to explore.org, welcome to the community. And for our longtime watchers, welcome back. We're glad you're here. Explore.org is the world's largest live nature cam network with more than 180 live cameras all over the world. Right now, we are actually not watching a, a camera on wildlife, obviously. This is the Warrior Canine Connection, and it is a, a nonprofit that trains service dogs for veterans and the service dogs start in the whelping room inside the warrior canine connections puppy enrichment center for the first few weeks of their lives uh, and they're there with their mother staff and volunteers take care of the puppies for 24 hours a day seven days a week during that time they then move into a playroom at about four weeks old where they begin to become socialized uh, to other dogs and to the job ahead we're glad to have the opportunity to watch these future service animals. And as a reminder to everybody, if you have comments or questions for Brian and I, please drop those uh, in the chats and we'll be looking for them throughout the broadcast today. Uh, Brian, we certainly have a lot to talk about. Um, so where are we headed first? We do. So a lot of season right now is birding season, but and we're starting our tour today in Laguna Niguel in Southern California, where Unfortunately, Ariana Hummingbird's eggs were eaten by a scrub jay. Yeah, in just a moment, the hummingbird flies from the nest and then the scrub jay come down and take advantage of the nest. Uh, scrub jays, they're opportunists. Um, if you live in eastern North America, you might be familiar with blue jays. And basically, you know, the scrub jays in the west, they're a variety of species, but they kind of form or occupy the same niche. So generalist omnivores. They'll eat a wide variety of things in most, most cases. Uh, but this was a scrub day taking advantage of an opportunity. Uh, and for them, a bird egg represents an extraordinarily valuable meal. There are probably few wild foods that can really match the nutritional value of a bird egg. Now, from Ariana's perspective, it's something completely different. Ariana, she's a female Allen's hummingbird. And although I've seen hummingbirds chase and harass small birds that venture close to their nest, Ariana probably weighs about three grams. So she's not physically capable of fighting off a bird as large as a scrub jay, which, uh, you know, for an adult scrub jay, that might be 70 grams at least. So her best option then is to save herself and live to reproduce another day. Ariana already successfully reared one clutch this year and may nest again in the same tree. So we're watching along with many of you uh, to hope to be able to see her do that. And if necessary, we'll reposition the camera to provide the views of this who is in the process of persevering through loss. And Brian, you know, nesting season is really full of drama and conflict for so many uh, different birds, uh, and even very large birds experience it. Yeah, next up, we're going to Charlo, Montana, to the Owl Research Institute's Canada Goose Cam, where we've definitely had some drama over one of the, this nesting territory. So this was a challenge for the nest itself and the nest platform. Occupancy of this nest will be maintained by overt threats and fights. And this pair on the nest has had to defend itself from challenges on several occasions. Uh, if, you, if you've seen Canada geese, you know, before hanging out on a lakeside or whatever, often it looks like they're, they're fairly gregarious and, and fairly social much of the year, but uh, that that uh, sociability really wanes in spring as they establish nesting territories. This platform was originally constructed for osprey, uh, but as we've seen with other stable and unoccupied nests, large nests, Canada geese are keen to use them for their own needs. Uh, and I think when I'm watching these birds, it really shows that homes are often places worth defending, especially if you're an animal whose reproductive success might depend on it. This pair's first egg was laid on April 1. Uh, so we might expect actually to see uh, some eggs hatch sometime in, um, I think some, maybe sometime in early May, depending on how many eggs 
uh, the pair happens to lay. And we have more to talk about regarding birds, but we're gonna take a break from North America for the moment and head to Central America for our next clips. Uh, next clip, we have a very cute little fish. I love when fish get so super curious and come say hello to the cams. We're coming to Honduras with Utopia Village Reef Channel Cam. This is a, uh, a spotted trunk fish, I believe, and it's a member of the boxfish uh, family. They have plate-like scales that are fused together to form a box-like uh, carapace. And they're also, I learned today when I was reading about them, they're a poisonous fish. They can secrete a chemical defense on the surface of their skin to ward off um, predators. And in this clip, it really doesn't have anything to do with you know, defenses, of the fish itself. I think the fish is just showing a bit of curiosity as it investigates the camera housing. Fish are often labeled as dim-witted creatures by people. And because of our biases and that stigma that we apply to fish, we can often fail to see that fish are individuals and they can show curiosity and certainly the urge to explore. Uh, so there's some individual fish that have been known to use this area on the Utopia um, village cameras from time to time. So watch for those animals uh, if you like to enjoy tropical underwater uh, views. And Brian, I think as we're, we're headed, we're staying in Central America for our, our next uh, couple of clips, but we're heading into an upland environment for these. Yeah, next we're heading down to Costa Rica to our Toucan Rescue Ranch, where they rehabilitate wildlife from Costa Rica, including sloths and crocodiles. So this is in the uh, sloth playground, which is a, a, an area where sloth can begin to um, gain strength and skills in climbing trees before they are rewilded. And there's a, a rescued crocodile that is, that is able to get some sunshine in this area. Of course, it's not big enough to harm the sloths, so they wouldn't put them together if that was the case. Uh, but uh, as that sloth approached uh, the crocodile, which is nicknamed um, Viserion, uh, Viserion displaces or, or displays some warnings saying, stay away. I'm not really comfortable with you approaching me. It's interesting that, though, to see the sloth's reaction. You can see right here how the sloth is sort of raising its arm up in the air. Yeah. That's really kind of like a defensive posture. Uh, I, I've seen videos where people interpret this as a sloth saying hello or waving or wanting a hug or whatever. <laughs> but when sloths are doing that, it's definitely not the case. The slug is saying, I don't like this. I'm, I have these big claws, stay away from me. So it's more or less kind of like a defensive posture than anything else, or to make it look larger in a situation where maybe it feels a little uncomfortable or threatened. Uh, the, about a little bit more before we move on about the baby crocodile though, uh, Viserion is a baby crocodile who's found with mobility issues. Uh, he really couldn't use his back legs. So caretakers and wildlife veterinarians at Toucan Rescue Ranch thought originally that Viserion was suffering from some sort of calcium deficiency, but later found that he had a fractured lower back. So Toucan Rescue Ranch is running a fundraiser for him right now, and they're working to rehabilitate him so he can eventually be reached uh, uh, or re rewilded. Um, and if you want to find out more about that, you can go to their website at toucanrescueranch.org. Uh, and, it, you know, Brian... We, we love watching the sloths, but of course the sloths and, um, and Viserion aren't the only animals available to us on the cams at Toucan Rescue Ranch. Yeah. We also have Toucan TV, which we've had Curtis the Toucan, and good news is Curtis is actually being rewild. Yeah, so we're not going to have the opportunity to watch Curtis um, in his enclosure anymore. Uh, Curtis was a chestnut mandible toucan that we have been watching. So he's, you know, about to, or has already been released into the wild. So currently the enclosure um, houses a different toucan. This is Annabelle, who is a different species, a rainbow build uh, toucan. She is just beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, she is a permanent resident of Toucan Rescue Ranch because she is not able to um, survive in the wild on her own. So, uh, She's just a, a gorgeous bird, and we thank Toucan Rescue Ranch for giving her at least the opportunity to have a good life. Go in and out of this enclosure from time to time in the future. 
All right, Mike, we lost you there for a second, but we are we are back. Um, and that actually concludes our tour for today. But we do have a new segment that we're very excited called Egg Watch, where Explore.org currently has 150, 185 live cams, and over 50 of them are dedicated to birds. And currently we have now eight nests with eggs. So, uh, Mike, everyone's waiting for these eggs to hatch. Uh, when do you think these will be for these nests? Yeah, uh, bird nerds get to explore.org because this is one of the best places for you to to watch um, birds rear their rear their young chicks, care for their eggs. Uh, it, it varies, you know, depending on these different species. Uh, let's take a look at the good decora eagles first in Iowa right now. Actually, they are on uh, egg watch. They are looking for uh, chicks to hatch. Um, really, any day now it could be. Um, sometime like April 5 or 6 could be a little bit earlier with bald eagle eggs. They usually incubate for about 35 days. Um, and we're coming up on that point right now for these eggs in particular. So yeah, April 5 or 6. Uh, and then, <coughs> excuse me, Brian, moving on to uh, California at the Sauces bald eagle nest. Yeah, we're also on egg watch there, just a single egg in this nest. And it could hatch, you know, sometime between now and April 6. Also in the Channel Islands in California at the Two Harbors nest, uh, there's a single egg in this nest that could hatch sometime around April 6 or April 8. Not exactly sure, but sometime in that time range. We have uh, a nest back going back to Iowa at the Decor nest that actually has six eggs in it. And a Canada geese will incubate their eggs uh, for about 28 days. 28 days after the last egg is laid. So maybe we could be looking at a hatch a month, maybe April 27 or 28 or so, if I've done my math right. Also in uh, associated with the, the Raptor Resource Project that um, we have, oh, oh, excuse me, before we get to that nest, um, let's move on to um, the peregrine falcons in the Chesapeake. Yes. Uh, so their estimated hatch date, maybe about 33 days after incubation begins. So they have four eggs in there and incubation has begun recently. So maybe we're looking at the first week of May for this peregrine falcon nest in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. And then moving back to, again, yeah, the Raptor Resource um, Project uh, at the Great Spirit Bluff peregrine falcons. Uh, again, 33 days after incubation begins. Two eggs currently, sometimes um, you know, we have more eggs than that in this nest. We have a new female in the nest this year. So we're not exactly sure if this is the entirety of her clutch or maybe she could lay another. We don't know, um, but maybe hatching towards the end of the first week in May here. Then looking to um, one of the taller birds in North America, great blue herons going down to Chesapeake Bay. Uh, the estimated hatch date on these is kind of unknown. We don't know how many eggs they have in the nest. Sorry, I think my uh, internet dropped you just for a second there, Mike. But I think what you were what you were saying is the great blue heron's nest, just the way it's per, uh, positioned from the camera angle, we can't see down into the nest bowl. So we we're assuming that there are eggs there because we've seen the pair there the whole time, but we just don't know exactly how many eggs there are yet. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for picking up where I was um, leaving off there due to my um, my internet dropping for a few seconds. Uh, we yeah with great blue herons uh incubation begins immediately and they have asynchronous hatching so it's not necessarily like a canada goose nest where basically all the the eggs hatch at once um it could be many days in between hatching of great blue heron nests uh but usually incubation occurs for 27 days or so so we're not really sure when the hatch date for this is but it could happen maybe towards uh, the end of the month for the earliest eggs, depending on when they started incubating those and how many are in there. And then finally, we'll head back to Montana. We highlighted um, this, uh, this pair of geese earlier in the broadcast, but at, um, at the Canada Goose Nest in, in Montana, uh, we, I think maybe sometime in early May, depending on how many uh, eggs this goose happens to lay just one in the nest right now. And she could certainly have many more. And that is 
all of the active nests right now, if you're keeping score at home, here's the eggs that we have. And uh, coming up uh, a little bit in a, a month or so, we have ospreys and we have puffins and a lot more birds to watch on explore.org. And we'll be keeping up with all of the nests on egg watch. And Mike, it looks like it seems we have a couple of questions coming in. If you want to answer a couple of those. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, somebody was wondering about the eagles at Decora North, which is another camera that we have in Decora, Iowa of, of, of an eagle nest. And they uh, laid a single egg, but the egg turned out to be not, um, not viable. So somebody was wondering, will the Norths probably have another clutch? And I think I remember reading from the Raptor Resource Project that they suspect that it, it's not too late in the season for that to happen. I don't know if it has happened um, or not. I don't, I don't think so, but it's it's possible. If they would have continued to incubate that egg, even though it was unviable, then yeah, that would have kind of been it for the reproductive chances for the year. But I think there is still a chance of the Norths having another another clutch this year. Uh, somebody else was wondering about Ariana, again, the hummingbird that we featured at the very beginning of the program. Will she lay another egg, uh, or was she, was she in the same nest? I, I don't think she is. I think the... Uh, the webcam observations that we've had so far, Brian, and maybe you've you've seen some other information than me, but it seems like she has been uh, working to build another nest nearby. Uh, at least I think that was what I was gathering. So she will lay again in, in the same nest if she's successful, but maybe since she had um, bad luck recently, she's looking to hide her nest in a different location. Yeah, unfortunately, it does seem like maybe this she will be moving on to another nest. But if we can find it, we will move the camera towards it. And then finally, one other uh, quick question here that we can try to answer. Uh, this is going back to the geese in Montana. Somebody writes in, is this nest the one that has had multiple females lay uh, in in the nest in the last year, you know, I don't know. I haven't paid that close attention, um, but but it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. I think this was the nest last year, Brian, where there was a Canada goose nesting in it. We saw that happen last year, if I remember correctly. So, it could certainly be the same one. Awesome. Well, that looks like all the questions we have for now. If you have any more questions, please drop them in the chat, and our helpful moderators will send them our way. Uh, but coming up this week, we have a few other live programs. Of course, we have the AfriCam show coming up tomorrow at 7 a.m. Pacific time. If you're feeling like you're going to want to go on a virtual safari from the comfort of your home, definitely tune into the AfriCam show. And on Thursday, we have AfriCam's Wild Moments show, where they show us the best highlights from all the AfriCam cams. And as far as live cams that you're looking for this week, Mike, what, what are you looking at? I think I mentioned this last week, but I'm still looking at Sandhill Cranes in the morning, at least, just because it's it's such a great season. I checked on them earlier today. There were just cranes all over the all over the place at the Row um, Sanctuary in Nebraska with our partner, the Audubon Society. So, yeah, it's it's been um, really fun to watch that scene, uh, and I think we still have some some time to enjoy the crane migration before they continue their journey north for the summertime. And what about you? I, I'm with you on, on the bird migration because now in South Africa, we have Camphers Dam. The flamingos are back. And so I'm super excited to see these flamingos. You see all the beautiful colors all times of day. And it's just really relaxing to watch. And if you're not already following us on social media, here's where you can find us on all the platforms, including YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And uh, if you haven't seen our latest video on YouTube, it's a wonderful story of a rescuing a, a buffalo in South Africa. And Mike, as far as other than subscribing to social media, how can people also get involved with Explore.org? Yeah, there's definitely opportunities. Of course, uh, we welcome people to contribute in the chats um, by commenting on what you saw and discussing what you saw. But also, there's uh, uh, many volunteer opportunities available with us. So if you are interested in being a moderator for any of our, our chats, uh, either on YouTube or directly on Explode.org, or if you want to become a camera uh, operator, there's opportunities for that as well. So you can go to Explode.org slash volunteer, fill out this form, We'll get back to you with more information 
So thanks to all of our volunteers, um, no matter where you happen to be and no matter how many hours you end up working. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous responsibility at times, but we thank you all. We certainly couldn't do it uh, with without you. Lovely. And coming back to our Warrior Canine Connection puppy room cam, it's always a joy to see these puppies living their, their best puppy lives just playing. <clears throat> But that is all the time we have for today's show. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us. I want to give a special thank you to all of our moderators, our camera operators, and, of course, Mike Fitz. And this week, we would like to dedicate the end of our show to Cam Op Cat. That's right. Uh, recently, a member of the Explore team, Cam Op Cat, passed away. And Catherine worked behind the scenes as our lead camera operator. She trained and managed our army of volunteer camera operators. And by extension, her work helped connect millions of people around the world with wildlife, nature, and animal sanctuaries. We didn't have a, a Fan Cam Friday contest last week because we wanted to showcase some of the screen captures from Cam Op Cat's collection. And today we'll end the show with some of those. Thanks for watching, everybody. And Catherine, we will miss you. Mm -hmm.